We're going to discuss whether high bar back squatting or low bar back squatting is better for shot put and discus and we're going to start right now. What's up everybody, it's Dane Miller from throwsuniversity.com and if this is your first time to the channel and you're interested in becoming a better thrower, you want to get stronger, you want to be more explosive, make sure that you like, you subscribe, and you ring that notification bell so we can help you become a champion. So one of the most polarizing discussions in all of sports performance comes down to what is better for sports performance when we're talking about the back squat. Should we be doing a high bar back squat with full range of motion or should we be doing a low bar back squat to 90 degrees or a low bar back squat with full range of motion? And this is something that is very polarizing for multiple different reasons. And a lot of it is the high bar back squat comes from the Olympic weightlifting crowd, the low bar back squat comes from the powerlifting crowd, and these two crowds, weightlifting and powerlifting, tend to dislike each other. They get into arguments. They argue about which sport is better than the other one. They argue about which movements transfer better for sports performance. And it ends up being this long, overblown, cyclical discussion that never has a resolution. And hopefully today, we can provide that resolution. So first, right off the bat, what is a low bar back squat? If we can think about someone who is executing a low bar back squat, they're gonna be putting their bar a little bit lower on their back. They won't be placing that bar below the neck like the high bar back squat. Instead, they'll be putting it a little bit closer to their rear delts. And what this ends up doing is it's going to put that trunk a little bit more forward and they're gonna sit their butt back without any knee flexion moving forward right off of the bat. So that low bar back squat, they're gonna sit their butt back as deep as they possibly can before the knees start to track forward. And typically, and typically low bar back squatters won't have their knees or their shin angle travel in front of their toes. Their butt goes back quite a bit. They get a decent amount of hip flexion, but they're getting that hip flexion from having that torso come forward. This is a great movement to utilize to really target the posterior chain. It's a great movement if you want to utilize a ton of weight. You can go through a shorter range of motion and you can lift a lot of weight when you're doing the low bar back squat. It's a great tool if you have somebody who's very quad dominant and you're trying to target their hamstrings. It's a great tool even if you're using this for football players, for offensive linemen, for wrestlers to a point. This is a great exercise and it's a great variation for the back squat. Now, if we're gonna talk about the high bar back squat, the high bar back squat, the bar is gonna be a little bit just below the neck and we're gonna see athletes where we think about the knees are traveling forward and the hips are traveling backward at the exact same time. So think about a rope is attached to the knees and a rope is attached to the hips and the rope to the hips is pulling back and the rope to the knees is pulling forward. So the athlete is gonna be a little bit more upright with their trunk. They're gonna need a little bit more ankle mobility because the knees are gonna be traveling forward. So there's gonna be a steeper degree of dorsiflexion in the ankle. So the ankle has to be very, very mobile to keep those heels grounded. The trunk position is going to be much more upright in that high bar back squat. And the lifter is going to have a little bit more mobility executed in this movement throughout their hips, again, throughout their ankles, and even a little bit more in that upper back because they're gonna be holding that upright posture. So now that we've figured out exactly what is the low bar back squat, what is the high bar back squat, how can we determine which one is better for the sport of throwing, for shot put and discus specifically? So one of the things that I like to do is sit there and say, all right, what do gliders need? What do spinners need? What do discus throwers need? And we all know right off the bat that they need a tremendous amount of strength, okay? So we know they need strength, right? They're gonna be going through this rapid rate of coordination, so they have to have a tremendous amount of strength. They also have to have some really good mobility. We know that discus throwers, we know that shot putters get into these really deep positions with their trunk. We know that that's gonna contribute to being more mobile and the more mobile a thrower is, the deeper they can catch in that position in the, at the power position and then ultimately the further that they're gonna be able to throw. We also know one of the big key factors behind throwing is dynamic trunk 
control, DTC, dynamic trunk control. So we got to think about someone like Ryan Krauser or Joe Kovacs. When Joe Kovacs grounds that right foot in the middle, his torso is upright and it's over his knee, it's over his ankle in the middle of the circle. And that's from his dynamic trunk control. Think about somebody like Barry Sanders. He was so agile on the football field because his trunk was always holding a very strong position while his legs were doing all the work and helping him juke. It's the exact same concept when we're talking about throwing. And then finally, to be a very, very good thrower, we've got to think about what's the power transfer here. So what do I mean by this? How well does this exercise transfer over to other movements that might help improve the sport of throwing? How well does this exercise transfer directly to the sport of throwing? So now we can really start to think about what is that power transfer? So once we break all this stuff down, now we can start to see, okay, we've got the low bar back squat set up here. We've got the high bar back squat set up over here and we can start to see, all right, let's just make a simple comparison here. We've got four different elements that are key factors behind throwing very, very far. And we can start to see, all right, in the strength realm in the strength element, which wins out here, a high bar back squat or a low bar back squat, typically, the low bar back squat is always going to win out for various different reasons. It's a shorter range of motion movement, so it's a little bit easier to execute with a lot more weight. So right off the bat, we can start to sit there and say, all right, the low bar back squat is definitely going to win out the strength component. Now, that doesn't mean that people can't squat a lot of weight with a high bar position. We've had Sam Mattis squat well over 600 pounds with a high bar back squat for multiple different reps. But when it's all said and done, if Sam Mattis, a world championship finalist, if he trains specifically with the low bar, in 99 times out of 100 cases, he's going to squat more weight with that low bar position. So the strength position is going to be in favor of the low bar back squat. When we're talking about mobility, what are we looking for with throwing? We want to have that trunk mobility with rotation. So there's not really a rotational aspect that's going to come into play with either of these movements. But let's start talking about some hip mobility. Let's start talking about ankle mobility. Let's start talking about even a little bit of that thoracic mobility. If we can think about the high bar back squat, you have to have a little bit more thoracic extension than in the low bar back squat. And that's going to be in favor of the high bar back squat here when we start talking about that specific aspect of mobility. We mentioned the ankle mobility, the dorsiflexion. If we can achieve a tremendous amount of dorsiflexion, in most cases, the athlete will also be able to replicate that through plantar flexion. Plantar flexion is a key factor of the middle portion of the circle. So if you can think about planting that right foot, if you're a right-handed discus thrower or a right-handed shot putter, think about Frederick Dakers. If he's got that right foot planted, he has tremendous plantar flexion. And that's going to be in favor here with the high bar back squat. I would even say too, hip mobility tends to be an area of power lifters that tends to be a big problem. Guys that do low bar back squat, they go a little bit wider with their stance and they end up getting very tight hips. They get really, really tight IT bands and that can lead to long term hip problems. And that's why hip replacements are very prevalent with veterans in the sport of powerlifting. The high bar back squat is going to help improve hip mobility and lower back mobility. So right here, we're going to say that high bar back squat favors mobility in this realm over the low bar back squat. Now, when we head into that dynamic trunk control, this is an area that I believe needs to be discussed tremendously. I think that a lot of low bar back squatters tend to have a forward posture when they're squatting. And I also believe that that can carry over to the circle. A lot of people that tend to lean very, very forward in the squat tend to lean a bit when their right grounds in the middle of the circle. Now that could be fixed with technical cues, but it's, it's something that can carry over from that posture of the back squat. And if you actually think about this, one of the things personally that I struggled with as a, as a thrower is that a lot of my low bar back squat numbers, 600 pounds for multiple reps with a low bar back squat. Now, if you watch me high bar back squat, 
I have a high bar back squat that actually looks like I'm doing a low bar back squat. I tend to lean forward, and the reason why I'm leaning forward is because of how strong my hamstrings and lower back are from training that low bar back squat. So my lower back is very strong, my hamstrings are very strong, but my posture, my dynamic trunk control is not as prominent because I low bar back squatted for so long. You can even see this in Sam actually. Sam did low bar back squat for quite a long time and he has a little bit of a forward lean in his high bar back squat because his dynamic trunk control is not as optimal as it should be. What I like to think about here is the high bar position, that hip flexion and a little bit more upright torso, again, is going to be very similar to where we're at when we ground in that right foot in the middle of the circle, where we're at when we're in the power position. And that's why I'm gonna lean, the dynamic trunk control aspect goes towards the high bar back squat. Now, here's a big discussion. Low bar back squatters are extremely strong. They're also extremely powerful if they're doing plyometric work. Okay, now the big issue that I have seen in the past, and we've got an athlete here right now, he's squatted 565 pounds in high school with a low bar position. The problem is his front squat is over 200 pounds less than his low bar back squat. So that power transfer is not as prominent, it's not as developed, and that actually takes us back to that dynamic trunk control. There's a lot of low bar athletes, a lot of low bar squatters struggle with the front squat. And that in turn leads to a lacking of power transfer. Then when they go catch a clean, they get folded forward in that clean position. So the low bar back squat, you can be powerful as long as you're doing a little bit more mobility, as long as you're doing a little bit more plyometric work, but you've got to do a little bit of extra work. I believe the power transfer from the high bar back squat carries over tremendously well to the Olympic lifts, to the snatch, to the power snatch, to the power clean, to the full clean, even to behind the neck jerks. If you can think about Sam Mattis, he has behind the neck jerk 500 pounds and his dip position is very, very similar to where he's gonna be when he's high bar back squatting. And that's a key component. If we're talking about low bar back squatters, they tend to dip forward quite a bit and then they lose a little bit of that force development when they're driving vertically. So power transfer, the high bar back squat takes the cake because high bar back squats transfer so well over to the Olympic lifts and then the Olympic lifts can be utilized as a gauge to see where your throwers are in their development, where they're at in respect to how well they can produce force and how quickly they can produce force. And I believe in a very good system that Olympic lifts can also be utilized to help peak your thrower. So in this discussion, the high bar back squat wins three to one, but both of these lifts are excellent lifts. They're both tools that you can utilize in training and you can utilize them at different points of the season depending on what aspect or what element you wanna focus on. So if you want more information and you want help designing a strength training program and you want someone else to put that together to help you become a better shot putter or a better discus thrower, head over to throwsuniversity.com and you can pick up a custom built strength training program. If you want more videos about throwing and about technique, click on this card right here. Until next time, guys, peace.